Good morning from a very wet Wellington. I'm Aldu. And I'm Horia. And today we have the pleasure of welcoming Tony Ponton, um, a longtime colleague of mine. We've worked together uh, quite a few times in the past. Uh, I've always been impressed with Tony's um, energy and insight. So to start with, Tony, tell us a bit about your river of life. Oh, thank you, and thank you for the praise. So much appreciated. I've always enjoyed working with yourself. So it's a, a, a mutual two way there. Um, yeah, look, I grew up in the in, in agility. I started doing the agile thing in about 1999, 2000. So you know, I sort of say to people, I've been doing this for you know, I'm in my third decade now. So I don't know if that equates to just being old or experienced, one of the two. But you know, when they introduce you as a as a an elder or a pioneer, then you know you're really on the on the on the downward slide. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I had the opportunity to grow up one of the premier agile institutions in Australia, where you know we really did what would would be rated as probably one of the first business agility transformations, actually from top to bottom to sideways, etc. Um, and it was a great experience with some really great people, and and that's you know stood me in good stead over the years. From there. I moved into the, many of the different facets of consulting with organizations across the world. And then as the pandemic itself struck, I was part of a team that came together that, that created the remote agility framework, um, which is, you know, for us has propagated itself right across the world now, helping organizations work better in a remote and a hybrid way, agnostic to their, to their way of working so that that's that's a whistle stop of where i've been in the last uh, <laughs> 30 odd years well um three sentences to explain a 30 year span <laughs> <laughs> that's quite succinct there tony <gasps> wonderful <laughs> well you know i didn't want to rabbit on too much <laughs> okay so I want to come back to something you've just said uh, that you shared with us as you you were part of quite a big business agility transformation mm. um, and just to, to to get us uh, get us going my first question is is that um, how did you uh, work with the oversight function or how did oversight uh, work in that big business agility transformation that you participated in yeah, it's an interesting thing because I don't think, you know, so so to give you the background of that, um, myself and, and, and uh, a bunch of other people were thrown into a room very early in that period of time and said, here's this new thing we're doing, go forth and try it. And, you know, we literally had Kent Beck's white book on XP and we, we had some success and we were working with a very little company then um, who are who, uh, well known now as, as ThoughtWorks. But um, we had some some good people from there as well that that helped us out, and and between the bunch of us, we sort of worked it out. Uh, what did happen though was we didn't really have we we really didn't have the premise of of um, a sponsor, if you like, or or that 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 leadership buy in. Right, this was really ground roots, and and it it really did sort of come to that 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 banging heads moment where it ended up being disbanded for a while. Um, and the, the group that had been doing that, we went off into different areas of the business. And it's what I, I like to term, you know, kept the, the agile lighter, for those who remember what a lighter is, you know, <laughs> the agile lighter flame alive <laughs> in the area. Uh, and in 2006, we had a very mercurial leader, Jeff Smith, who came along and, and reignited that and said, this organisation is going to be agile and we're going to go agile. Um, and the reason I put that background in, in there is because what happened from there is we did embark on, on on a transformation. I really dislike that word because mm -hmm. it's more a transition, if you like, than transformation. Right? But yeah, literally, that's that's what we embarked upon. Now, the problem for for us, as as I see it, and it happens right across the organisations across the world, is you you start to transform the the, the agility or, or transition in agility in the in the teams layers and perhaps the team of team layers. But then you, you you bang into this three-speed economy where you haven't looked at the, the governing systems, which is the oversight you're talking about. When I, and I'll talk about governing systems in a minute because I'm not just talking PMOs and project stuff, right? That plays a part. But then also you've got that third part of this, the, 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 the three-speed economy, which really, really does play part of that oversight, but I always separate it because people forget about it. And that's thinking about funding. 
and how you fund the organization and how you fund agility, right? And so when you plug those three together, the thing that I always say to people about that is, is that when you look at you look at this transition phase, is agility by its very road disseminates control, right? Mm -hmm. That's what it's meant to do. It's, it's meant to allow the teams and, and the people working within that bastion to be able to do what they need to do and move. However, when you're in an enterprise function, there's certain things that need to be done because that creates that tension. So answering your question about the oversight, very long blown sort of <laughs> uh, transition across that, is that in, in the beginning, we thought about it. In the beginning, we probably didn't do it as well as what we should have. And it was a phased thing that, that sort of we had to approach as we as we reached that situation of, of blocking, if you like. Um, I didn't really know the word for it back then, and I'm not sure many of us did. There was a couple who were quite clever in, in, in that. But, you know, one of the, the, the mandates there was we needed the, the ability for the teams in the organisation to be able to work, but still integrate with that oversight. Mm. And so we used Portfolio Adapter, right? Um, and and Horat is well versed in that. We came up with a, a thing called Concept Initiate, Deliver and Deploy, right? Which was really, if you look at it, most people don't realise it. But, and I don't think most, most people who worked in it don't realise it. It was really, that's your gates, right? And what we were doing was agilizing the gates and allowing that to, to plug in so that we could still work in an agile way. We could allow our teams to work, but we were still satisfied ever so. As the transition took its life and we we rolled on and, and the maturity of, of what we were doing grew, we then were able to fold that back into a more agile thing that people recognise. We call it idea, um, discovery and delivery, but you could call it inception if you like, an ideation, right? Mm. Today's language, we've all got words for old things now, right? <laughs> but essentially in that package of that, one of the things that we did then was work with the organisation to, to have an enterprise portfolio governance that actually reflected the agile way of working that mm. included funding, you know, got to the stage where the funding was, you know, we rolled it from annually to quarterly to incremental funding. And so mm. the three started to work together in tandem, which is, you know, a very whistle stop there for me, but there was a lot of work in that, as you can imagine. That yeah, and it took a long time probably. Yeah, yeah, it did. Yeah, and just on that, you know, that concept initiate, deliver and deploy. So that's what we call a portfolio adapter, right? It allows your teams to do the agile S thing in those phases, but still have the outputs that 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 connect with the oversight and governing mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And if anybody's listening to this that is that has copied that, please don't. We made that up. <laughs> I've actually seen it. I've actually seen it out in the wild. And I've, uh, I've said to the person who was doing it, it's like, why are you doing that? We made that up. That's not a thing. It was a place in time and a token. And it's it's not something you should do unless you have to. Yeah. It's almost like copying a Swedish music uh, streaming services uh, uh, <laughs> <manager> <laughs> from a from a, a, a eight year old uh, YouTube video. Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> that cookie cutter will work in this organization, this organization regardless of the context but anyway it'll work so on that point um tony you, you you've worked with uh, multiple transitions after that you've hinted at that it was not just with this big organization but you have worked in other transitions as well so here's a here's a thing that we're noticing, and I wanted to uh, get your views on it. Um, in many cases, uh, we get organisations that decide, "Oh, we're going agile," and it's just uh, party hats and streamers and confetti all over the place, and uh, yeah, the pom poms and the, the the jazz hands, and it was an arbitrary decision. What what do you think oversight can do in order to qualify or to challenge the decision to go agile, in, in quotes? Um, what are the critical questions that you think can be asked by an oversight capability for a decision to go agile? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. It's, it's a very in-depth question. One of the things that I lean on with that, having seen this happen many, many times, and, and as you you have yourself, 
there is this decision all of a sudden to, to go agile and, and and when you're trying to filter out the reasonings for it, it's always many and varied right um i i recently had the, the opportunity to to do a cast with um and, and have a very good conversation with stephen bunga who wrote the art of action mm -hmm. and one of the one of the the, the terms he, he of reference that he uses with leaders is he uses the Spice Girl question, which is, what do you really, really want? What do you tell me what you really, really want? And oversight plays that part in that because for me, they need to understand what they really want. And often they've heard that Agile does X. You know, one of the big mis misnomers that you hear out there is, oh, Agile will allow you to deliver faster. Well, yeah, Waterfall could help you deliver faster. That's not the total thing that's going to do. So, so it's really getting to the in-depth of that. And oversight helps you challenge that in, in, in a number of ways, right? And mm -hmm. why I look at that, that, other, that the governance of the system and the, and the oversight of it is, is getting to that cause of what you really, really want, but also those things that constrain your organisations, right? And one of two things happens. They either go to the track of this agility thing and run headlong into it. And we've already talked a couple of symptoms that happen, right? But the other thing for me is the constraints that hit the agility, right? So they do one of two things. Agility, they, they throw all the constraints out and then they wonder why they have a problem and they blame Agile for that. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, Agile's just too out there and, you, you know, self-empower all these teams, let them go. But there's no constraints, right? So not all constraints are bad. Some constraints are good. Mm. It's particularly in the enterprise organisations where you you answer to a board or you might be a, you know financial product or regulators, you have those, right? But then the other thing is it goes to the left hand side and is that they don't change any of the constraints, and they still want what agility offers them, but they still don't want to change the constraints that they have in place, right? And those constraints play many layers. So when I'm talking about constraints, I'm not just talking about process. Yes, that has a place. And I'm not just talking about rules. But the big thing that plays into that is also how you lead and how you govern the system of work as a whole, thinking about, you know, those, those real pillars of clarity that allow you to understand the governance system of your organisation. Well, thank you, Tony. Um, I, was, I couldn't help but smile um, because um, we... We see so many of of those um, uh, of those incidents that you've described that um, people always neglect. Not always, but many organisations do neglect that part of asking upfront what it is that you want, what you really, really want. So, and not having clarity of intent upfront is just an, uh, inv inviting uh, chaos into the front door. Yeah, and, and, and I see this, you know, I don't want to be denigrative of, of certain things, right? But what I what, what what I do see is is there's a there's an intent out there for certain consultancies and certain um, consultants who who coach and lead this kind of thing to say that purely leaning on having a strategic direction and then banging in objectives and key results will get you where you want to go to fix that, right? Now, I'm not saying those are bad mechanisms in any shape or form because I'm, I don't want any hate mail because they have the right place at the right time, right? But if if you're not enabling those layers of thinking about how you're going to govern the system of whole, how you're going to lead it, and how those constraints and things play into that, then you're just creating lists of work. And, you know, um, Stephen brought that home to me really clearly when we were having that conversation about the really, really want... And ask the question about okay, and said, so, well, you know, they work really well if, right? Mm -hmm. and you, have to you have to connect your stri strategic intent to your delivery and your delivery to your strategic intent, right? Mm -hmm. Not an easy thing to do, but that is something that you have to do to enable the organization and, and to play into this ability to unlock what agility actually offers the organization through the layers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite fascinating to me how often we have a confusion between strategy and ego-driven ambition, if you will. You have an individual that goes, yes, I know, we will do X. 
and people go, okay, well, they are the boss. We shall do as they say, right? Um, pushing uh, back on the person with the most authority is often career limiting. So we're missing good mechanisms for dealing with power gradients. Uh, what are your thoughts on managing power gradient <coughs> challenges? It, it's interesting that you, you you point that out because you I, you know I have seen that and you know I saw an organisation recently where you know they had a change in CEO and they had a change in leadership and they went from being very agile to to not agile um, and the people knew that that wasn't where it needed to go right um, and that made that 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 caused a lot of problems for them and now they're, they're stepping back in the way but that's you know they're not on their own there we see that happening around the world. And often that is this, this this leader has this vision or this strategic and says, we're going to do this. And everybody goes, well, whatever you say, exactly what you're saying, right? The conversation I like to have with them around that, it's not so easy. You know, it's not, it's easy for a leader to stick, the, you know, the flag in their people's hands and say, go on and go and do what I said. But it's turning the frame of reference around the other way and putting the flag in their own hand and saying, come on. And we're going to go this way together. And I'm going to listen to what you have to say about this because you're the people who actually know the business. I'm so extracted from it, right? So I like Esther Derby's model when I'm when I'm conversing and, and talking about this. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, I've the, the luck to have worked with Esther for the last 12 months. <clears throat> and she has a model called steering, enabling, enhancing, and making C model. And the theory around that, or the thought around that is there is a steering piece mm. to every organization that you need to invest in but you need to ensure that the knowledge is not just just held at that steering layer that we connect the people in the enabling enhancing which is your middle layer leadership or any of those kind of architectural type things right and we connect that so that they understand what it is and then with the making layer and then we have the fallback of the information flowing up so the biggest thing for me is is, is constructing that ability for the information flow throughout the organization. Um, and often, often when you talk to, to leaders of the ilk in that steering mechanism, the reason that they probably are leading in the way they are and take it to the front is that they can't see what's happening or they don't understand their organization as well as they could. And that's purely through the con construct of the organization. Often, the organization has been pulled apart, ripped back, pulled apart, put together, right? <clears throat> we all know that, that that continuous story. What what doesn't get seen is what I call the collaborative connective tissues of an organization, right? And, and, and literally what I mean by that is that the, the collaborative connective tissues refer to the fact that you, you, you need to enable your organization so that you have information flow both horizontally and vertically, right? So that you have a connect of the two. Now, when we re-pull organizations together or we, we, you know, we do a, a transformation or we do a whatever that be, we're actually tearing those, those, those apart. So take, take the instance of, you know, an organization decides to go with the aforementioned um, musical um, structure and creates tribes. All right, there, there, there's a very good point in token because what you've actually created is artificial silos and silos become chasms, right? And therefore your collaborative connective tissues immediately disappear. Now, human beings are an amazing crew for working out how to get around things, right? But what they do is they optimize for locality because that's what affects them. They're not thinking of optimizing organizationally. And mm. to answer your question in the long run there, Corey, is making that point to those in the steering layer that they have to consider that because what they have now is optimization in these these silos and they haven't thought of it across and thinking about that as an organizational construct or, or the system as a whole as i call it. yeah but you don't understand tony my um bonus is tied to my organization's performance not to my partner uh or, or this partner's organization's performance so i don't really care <laughs> Well, I feel sorry for your organization and your employee, Aldo. No, no. <laughs> no, you know where I'm coming from, right? I do, I do, I do. I do. So essentially what I'm saying is um, 
when my personal incentives are mismatched to what should happen for the benefit of the organization and actually not just for the benefit of the organization but the the people that we serve not just for this three month um sort of uh, reporting cycle but to thrive over the longer term all of a sudden the discussions are different i agree i agree and, and yeah we we all know that the way that remuneration is tied to performance creates issues because it it propagates the way things happen. However, I think that we have enough capital now uh, with with people who've been working across organisations across the world to show the inference to to those leaders that if you continue in that way, you might get a short term gain, but in the end, you're going to end up not having what you want. And mm likely not being there anymore right anyway that you know you could we, we have those examples so how do you create that longevity it still gets you the result that you want still increases the performance of the organization and gives you your ability to get your your funds back from the organization however also in in, in dear's longevity both for yourself and the organization and so i think that's that's the big thing there here's an interesting challenge um you were talking earlier about leaders not really understanding their organization as well as they could. And that brings to mind shows like Undercover Boss, for instance, where you disguise yourself, you go um, in the front lines of your organization, and all of a sudden, as a senior leader, you notice, oh, this is actually happening, and that is actually happening. And virtually every single show is like, oh, damn, why didn't I know this before? Yeah, because you didn't go to the Gemba. You didn't go to the actual place of work. So that brings to me uh, the challenge of in the world of remote work, how do we support leaders to go to the Gemba in a manner that is welcoming and um, perhaps uh, anonymous enough such that it doesn't have this, oh my God, the minders of the this and that VIP are kind of distracting from what's actually going on? That's a brilliant question because that is that is something that's being faced across the world right now. You know, we used to have that, you know, let, let's premise the fact that remote and hybrid working is not you. I was doing distributed type of work. We, we called it distributed or there was a terrible offshore <laughs> word being mm-hmm. used then. But, the, you know, this has existed. However, now it's a much larger scale and many more organisations. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The first thing that the first thing I say to, to, to people in organizations is that it's very easy to poke at the leaders, by the way, okay, and say they're not doing X. But the reality is in this change to remote and hybrid, the leaders are probably the ones that have actually suffered the most, in my estimation, talking to people, because people who, who are working from home, there were certain things that we need to be conquered, but I think people are becoming more cognizant of the fact that your work is in your home, your home is in your work. We need to construct it in a way. Um, but leaders still struggle with that piece is, the, you know, people aren't in the building. I can't go to the Gemba, like you say. Mm-hmm. I can't just grab Johnny over here, or I can't stand by the water cooler and have a conversation with someone like I had. And, and that, to me, my answer to that is because they're trying to do in, in digitality what they do in physicality. What I mean by the word digital digitality, um, that is the art of working and living in a digital environment, which is what remote and hybrid means we're doing now. So it's changing that frame for them and giving some mechanisms, mechanisms so that they're available to it. And I've seen some interesting ones along the way, right? There's no silver bullet because I think you have to look at the context of every organisation and how it's going to work. So what works for them over there might not work for these over here. But uh, let me give you a, a really good example. I saw a fantastic leader and a friend of mine, Craig Brown. He, he's, he has a um, always-on um, sharing platform that he uses uh, uh, and basically video facilitator, it's called. Sorry, I was struggling to remember the name. They just changed their name to Burst or something to that effect. What a great the great thing about this is, is that it has a foyer and he sits in that foyer virtually and it's an open door policy. People know that they can come in and talk to him about anything or if they need his attention, mm. they, they can chat with him. So he's opened that door to start with, right? And the, the important thing about that is, is that that's a great thing to do, but then it's taking notice and, and attending. So someone comes in there, you've got my complete attention, Yes, what do you intend? Right, and I intend to help you by doing X and actually making those things happen. That starts to bring in that, 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 that situation that people are starting to listen. 
I think the other thing is in, in virtuality is, is setting the context in the organization with your, your people, with your teams, that you're going to appear in all these things and I'm just a fly on the wall. What leaders make the mistake of is they immediately go into leadership mode when they attend and start to take over. Mm. Uh, and that, that comes from that, that thing we were talking about before. Remote and hybrid are much like agility. By its very road, it disseminates control because people aren't in the same place at the same time mm. and they have a way of working. And then you have a leader who's used to being command and control that comes in on top of that and the control's not there, so they take command. And that's a bad thing. And that's, it's, it's us helping them understand that listening um, and then asking the right questions and their, their method of attending changes. So, for example, it's not saying, well, I'm going to do X and I'll take X, X. Team, what do you need me to do? Mm. Well, how can I help with you to do that? Right? Or I can hear you saying you intend to do this, but have you thought of X, Y, and Z because you're not thinking in this frame and I can help you with this? So it's a, it's a complete different change. And again, these things don't happen overnight. It takes a while to do this, but you can, you can do those mechanisms. And my last one, I can see Alan's got a question for me, but my last one is, is really the water cooler thing. You can recreate that, right? We have done that. Mm -hmm. and that's literally designing for that context to say, we're going to have these times. There's two ways to do it. There's having that, that ability for people to just mix and match in a particular room or, or virtual instance where they can all catch up together and you encourage all of that. Or at the beginning of every meeting, you encourage the fact that you, you have that, that, that 10, 15 minutes built, 20 minutes built in, that's purely for that conversation. Say, hey, you got the dog, all right, et cetera. And that brings that water and you'll get a lot more of that in there as well. Sorry, I, I could see. Oh, no, that's, that's all good. Um, I have a few on what you just shared. Um, I have a few uh, few thoughts as well. Um, one of the first things is uh, that we have to understand when it comes to uh, things like remote work or um, 10 years ago, it was called flexible work arrangements. It, um, so <laughs> I, I missed that one. I missed that one. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. um, and, and there was something like eight or nine different types of flexible work arrangements of which remote work was one. Um, and one of the key things that made it a success in organizations was uh, addressing the biases about if I can't see work happening, then work isn't happening. Yeah. Um, so that, that bias about I have to see the work happening and I'll measure the hour as the as the way of uh, it being measuring productive work. Um, that's one of the first things that you have to address as an organization. Don't measure the hours and assume that people are adults. You don't have to treat them like children. Once you've addressed those things, then the conversation about how do we work remotely, how do we measure outcomes, et cetera, is a lot easier to, to overcome. So that's the first point. Um, there was an example of an organization that embraced full-on remote working for a large part of their organization about 12 years ago. Um, they looked at all the non-essential uh, staff uh, support type functions that wasn't directly client facing and they went through quite a lot of process process a, a long process in order to change the biases from leadership change the way people are incentivized and they had some really interesting productive people so this this one guy it was a case he was following his favorite band in europe but he was doing work from Europe for the, for the head office. He needed to achieve certain outcomes every week. And then they didn't care whether he was in Germany or where, another country the following week, as long as he kept delivering uh, to what they have agreed. So there's many examples of that type of thing. And, and that, that's sort of playing into the gig economy. Um, we talked about the way people are measured. Um, hours is probably the worst thing that you can do to measure people's productivity. So 
go have a think about um, how else can you measure the outcomes of somebody? Not outputs, but outcomes. Outcomes. Yeah. Um, and work with the people, work with the team in order to, to do that. The other thing as well is, is there's an assumption that I'm noticing and the H Harvard Business Review and uh, Fortune and, and all of them over the last number of months have published quite a host of articles about the big resignation, the silent resignation, whatever it is, the term that, you, that you're calling it, on the back or during uh, lockdown and on the back of lockdown. And one of the interesting things is, is that 56% of um, people that, uh, of, of uh, workplace, uh, uh, how do you call it, w w well-being, has declined, 56% of those reasons were all related to increased job demands. So that's quite a big number because what do you do when you assign work to people or whether you expect work, set an outcome for a team? Because you can't see them struggling, it's out of sight and out of mind. So I think paying attention to, to the actual capacity and the workload that you assign to that capacity is something we miss in the remote context as well as um, out there in in-person work as well. Re I have to regularly talk to customers about, you've just assigned this work to this team, but have you considered their capacity? They're overloaded. They have 300 items in their work in process column. How do you think that, how sustainable is that? Yeah. So um, that they, they, so I have other points about this as well, but um, let, let's move on uh, a little bit. You, you talked about uh, the work that you've done through this organization called Remote AF. Um, can, and, and, and you've had examples of the type of encounters that you've had. Um, what is it that remote AF actually does? What what do they do out there for for the industry? Yeah, that's that's a good question, and and I just want to pick you up just quickly. I can't let it go. The 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 thing about um, monitoring people that you know there's a really terrible thing that's happened, and and we as practitioners, we as influencers, if and anyone who's listening to this we need to stop this happening. You know, it's the surveillance software, the surveillance type mechanisms that are being put in place. It's an article just, just came out, you know, yesterday around that. Literally measuring, you know, companies making a living now out of saying we can measure how long your people are actually at their keyboard. Now, that is just one of the worst things that could ever. And the fact that we would allow that to happen just because people are remote, remote and hybrid is, is ostensibly one of the most damaging things that we could allow an organisation or enable organisations to do because that plays into the other things you're talking about, the great resignation, the pressure, you know, transparency can be created in many other different ways. You don't mm -hmm. need doing that and outcome and output over the hours worked. That's, you know, one of the things and that plays into your question with remote agility framework, right? So when we... To give you a quick background, it'll very whistle stop how remote came, AF came along. Like many other organizations, um, the organization I worked for was a consultancy and the pandemic came along and we started to contract. Everything was shutting down. And our one of the, the founders, our founder, Andrew Blaine, had, had this Isaac Newton moment, we call it, but instead of the Apple, it was remote AF as he was out walking, clonked him and he came back and said, we got the, everybody here has been doing a lot of work, you know, flexible work and distribute. We can do something about this and we can do it with an intent that we've always wanted to do. This is the moment. And so we created a remote agility framework to, to do that. So and what, what do we mean by do that? We want to make and we enable anybody and any organisation in any place to be able to work in a remote or a hybrid frame for their organization in a better way designed to the context of their organization agnostic to the work or the ways of working that they have in place and so what we've ostensibly done is looked at that and we looked at the frame of the organization in in, in the layers of it for example from teaming models so how do you launch teams 
how do you enable those teams? How do you think about, um, you know, all of those things that we just talked about, working hours? How do we think about, you know, how, how people are feeling at home? How do we think about the transparency of progress so that people can, can see outcome out, over output, et cetera, right? Those things. Then we look at that at some of the, the whole, if you like, and think about that. Well, how do you extrapolate that when you've got more than one, right? Because leaders have got this situation now. They've got, you know, teams and tribes and squads and whatever it be and pods and all over the place. So we, we want to look at that in terms of what we call the all hands layer, which is bringing the sum of the whole up and how do we, how do we launch that and how do we put those mechanisms in place? And then extrapolating further to that, if you want a complete view of that and how do we do that in an enterprise mode? And all of these things, basically, we've created patterns and mechanisms that we, we propagate that allow you to launch those teams, consider how you do that, look at how you work better in that, how you examine the way that you're doing that and enable those mechanisms. Designing for the context of the organisation is the most important because what a lot of remote and hybrid organisations have done, and it, it does hark back to the pandemic, you know, they were happy to send everyone home. And in the beginning, we all sat there and we were on benches and lumps of wood. And, you know, I saw, you know, one person working on ironing board and stuff, but that was okay just to get things happening. But now it's become something that, that, that you know, people want to do. There's a lot of other con connotations around it, right? You heard me say before, home is in your work and your work is in your home. And the minute you add that, that, that quotient of that into it, that plays into the working hours because, you know, yeah. you've got your dogs and so, you know, <laughs> or your kids are running around or whatever that be. And, and, and there's a whole bunch of things. Plus, we also want to think about that in a sustainable way. So how do we create that in a, as a sustainable mechanism and thinking about what's the sustainability planet-wise, organisationally-wise and people-wise? This mm. is really clear, you know, sort of things around that. And then, of course, there's all, all of that psychological safety mechanisms that we want to think about as well because we know that in those mechanisms you know people have had you know um, suffered issues from being you know isolated and working at home so how do we make sure we we construct the connective mechanisms within those layers to allow people to actually pervade their team health and their personal health um, mm -hmm. mechanisms that allow you you know terrible things have happened where you you know we understand that you know um you know, violence in the home went up, domestic violence went up. That is, that's a fact. There's, there's stats out there, right? So how do we how do we allow people to let us know that they're not okay and how do we help them? And so these are the new mechanisms that leaders are having to think about as well. That's why they're, they're having to look at that. And so mm -hmm. the agility framework addresses that and much more. The other pieces to the puzzle that it thinks about, um, we're, we're recently going to, we're going to launch that. We've been looking at it for some time, but it's really about remote gov what we call remote governance or governing the system of, of of work as a whole you've heard me talk about that yeah it happens to help organizations to 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 work through that because a lot of this stuff's really easy to say it's a bit like intent-based leadership right which you gentlemen are really invested in and i love that because you know that that's one of my things and the the thing i get from leaders all the time uh, or, or, or organizations is yeah i understand this but how mm. how do i do it and, and that's that's where we come in and say, well, we have these mechanisms that allow you um, these patterns to to actually work through this and design it in a context that will get you the result that you want to. Thank you for explaining that, Tony. Um, I couldn't have I couldn't help but have a flashback when when we were seen home. Um, <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the the very first thing I had to do. Uh, I, I bought a, a cheap gaming chair a few years before the lockdown and it was okay to sit on it once a week uh, doing a little bit of gaming over weekends but within two weeks the, the phone collapsed um, and I had to throw the chair out and actually order a chair that could support my back better. Um, it's little things like that that's not apparent um, that you had that I had to learn along the way. Um, I think I spent a few thousand dollars in the end to to to, to get a, a remote work setup uh, that suits me, like a, a lifting desk is like, I didn't envision that I would need that before the lockdown. And then suddenly, <laughs> yeah, 
I have a whole assortment of different chairs here that we <laughs> as well. It's just astounding um, how how uh, it's totally changed for us. It's just a little thing, but you don't envision that. But it's not such a little thing, right? So, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I applaud you for bringing that forward because that's one of the things that we look at, right, in terms of thinking about how this works. And and, and yeah, that's an interesting thing because if people aren't comfortable in their, their workspace or... So this is something that HR, in essence, now, human... And I really don't like human resources as a word, but you, you understand people experience whatever they call themselves now in, in organisations are, are grappling with is, is that people are working from home. And how do we, how do we understand, you know, the best way for them to, to have a workplace and a workspace? Some organisations, you know, I know a couple of organisations that are um, really fantastic that, that actually provide a stipend or, or, you know, a grant to say, just go and here's... X amount of dollars, three thousand dollars. Go and get what you need to be comfortable in your workplace. Mm. Get you off the desk that goes up and down. Get a great gaming chair that you're comfortable in. Get a get a boom mic so that you you don't have a problem. All those things because all of that contributes to 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 that kind of thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, that's one thing that leaders can do differently. What what other things do you think leaders leaders need to do when? overseeing people in this uh, remote world of work? Interestingly enough, I don't think it varies that much from actually in the physical environment. And, and it plays into your, your wheelhouse, gentlemen. Um, I've been you know, working in this quite some time, and I had the, the pleasure of meeting David Marques. I'll invoke David's name right now. <laughs> Back when he first came to Australia, and it, it struck me then and it strikes me now and continues in, as such is actually changing the, the way that they lead to in leading with intent. Mm. Uh, again, I know that that seems a very easy thing to say, but it is a change. And for me, the one thing that leaders can do to empower their people in, in totality when they're working is, is actually using that leading with intent and thinking about the guide rails that they necessarily need to put in place. The thing about that is, is often they, they they say, well, that means I'm just turning the, you know, turning it over to the, the lunatics in the asylum and letting them run free and I'm giving them, how am I going to control? They're not quite getting the mechanism. You still have to have the right guide rails. You mm. still need to spend that, that time, that money and that effort enabling your people. So remembering David's pillars, you know, they have to have clarity of what you want to achieve, but they also have to have that competence and it's your job as a leader to enable them to actually do that. And, and for me, whether that be physical or remote, but remote remote when you move into remote, and I'll talk about hybrid in a minute because I haven't forgotten about that, but when you work into that, it just exacerbates those issues. Mm. And if they were there to start with, then it becomes a, a really big problem. Um, most leaders who are already practising that intent-based leadership, they tend to switch over quite quite easily and flex, then it just becomes about the mechanisms to enable them, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a key ingredient to excellent success in organizations is fabulous teamwork, where I really trust the guys that I work with. I really enjoy the process of collaboration. I have essentially built great friendships in the workplace. So when I'm getting into work, I'm going, hey, awesome, high five, we're doing great stuff. Now, in the context of remote work, what ideas can we reach out to to help us improve mutual trust, camaraderie, this spirit of, of teamwork? That's a, that's a fantastic question. It's one I love, actually, because... You know, I've been blessed to be part of some really, really great teams over the years. You know, there's a team that I worked with back in, in the um, in the middle 2000s. There, that such was the camaraderie that we built. Um, we were together for two years on a program of work. Such as the camaraderie when we have a when we have a reunion. Now people fly in from all over the world, and I learned some really good lessons from that. Those lessons extrapolate themselves into the remote frame. 
Um, hybrid can play a place in that as well, so we'll, we'll we'll tackle that in it. But there are there are a lot of things. So so let me let me start with you know again you have to try you have to try different things because different things will work for different teams and you need to get the team involved and they'll come, actually the teams will come up with the ideas if you really work with them and that's one of the things that we really enjoy in the framework we work with the teams is how are you going to how are you going to work together and and how are you going to come have it together and how are you going to get this 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 crystallization. I'll give you one example just to start with. It's something for, for people out there. Um, the remote AF team is completely distributed. In fact, a couple of the team, I've never actually physically met them, right? Because they worked in the in our Victorian team. Um, you know, our founder lives lives in Woodend up in up in the mountains. I live on an island just off the coast in Queensland, etc. But we wanted to we wanted to make sure that we had this this real group energy. So one of the things that came across our desk was that a remote or a virtual panic room type situation. And um, so we we actually did that event, and it was one of the most amazing experiences. Right, we're robbing a bank. I can tell you some personalities. We found some things about. There's some people in our team probably could make very good robbers, and they know <laughs> this. But the the interesting thing by doing that, it's not just that experience. So when you're selling this to people, it's not just that experience. It's the experience afterwards because you just saw me making a joke about, well, you know, you know who you are and you are, you are a robber. And, you know, it's those, it's those tendrils that allow the team to have that, those jokes and those in-jokes and those types of things. The, the second thing is don't shy away from having, you know, uh, and again, it just depends on the team, but we have, we, we have a, a virtual clubhouse type meeting is, is something that I've seen done and we, we borrowed it ourselves where on a Friday afternoon, everybody comes along. If you want an alcoholic drink, booty, that's good for you. If you want a cup of tea, whatever that be, but then it's just open slather and some fun. Um, the other thing that we've done, I, I did this exercise with, with a group and then borrowed it um, for our uh, uh, consultancy teams, the, the virtual trivia, which mm, that, a bit well. Yeah, works. but what we did was we put a different bent on that virtual trivia. So mm. virtual trivia itself works, great, do that one. But don't be afraid to do a, a bit of a hybrid with that. So what we actually did was we constructed the questions and we got people to walk out into their out into their environments and their streets, and they had to find certain things that, that match the trivia and take a photo of them. And so what we actually did was we mixed that 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 thing of they they had to go out into their environment and take photos. Now that caused a bit of fun, right? Because obviously people got to see different things. Also, what it did was gave people a window into other people's environments. Like, for example, mm. you heard me say I live on an island. I took a photo of X, and it had it had all this water. Well, you know, I suffered some I suffered some fun from everybody saying, "And you go to work in that every day." And I get you know, so. But the interesting thing is, people got a window into everybody's different yeah. you know, life, environments. So it's building those connections. And again, the other one is the water cooler. Please don't. You know, we have a virtual water cooler where everyone can, you know, sort of go in and you can post stuff and you can put, you know, we, we have a remote AF community that we've created around remote AF. And I, I highly recommend that as well for organisations is to, to allow your teams to create a community of some sort. You know, there's plenty of those things you can use Yammer or you can create whatever it be. But those communities where people can post some funny things or they can post articles of interest or they can get together and have those conversations as well. It just creates that. It just creates that living entity that becomes teams. Teams are just, you know, I always think of teams, and that's why I came up with that that collaborative connective tissues. It sort of came from the cell mm -hmm. sort of thing. Is because teams literally are living organisms. Mm -hmm. And if you think of the, uh, you know, a living organism or a cell, it, you, they react to certain stimulus while they're just sitting there and doing what they do. They do what they do. You, you bring something new in, which is like. A, COVID or something to that effect, then the cell reacts and yeah. something might happen and it might be adverse and then you have to repair the cell or you have to do something to that effect. And so, so that's the analogy that I tend to use. Yeah, as long as you don't have an ongoing cytokine storm. Anyway, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, there's something that you've mentioned that I want to just latch on to. You talk about gamification a little bit and mm, to, mm. to build the human connection. I came across... Uh, a website of a company that is actually investing in games that support mental health in the workplace. And with that is a phenomenon is over lockdown, 
the average age of gaming people increased. Mm. So a lot of people um, in their mid careers, you know, the I don't want to put a specific age to it. So uh, mid to late careers um, uh, have started uh, participating in this online gaming um, communities and, and phenomena. And that's there was research has shown that that's helped quite a lot with mental health uh, as well. So you talk about gamification, um, there could potentially be space for play in the workplace as a team. Mm. Um, there's there's gaming guilds and things that you can actually join, etc. And I know Horia loves to talk about play, and then he gets really funny looks uh, from recruiters. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but that I think that's another key important aspect is is that we have a natural tendency of learning through play. Yes, uh, the kids at home. As we grow up, that's how we've learned until the schooling system stamped that out of us. Um, but that's a whole different story. Um, I think, interestingly enough, with though, the, the, though um, I, I, when I was talking to Lisa Adkins, or Lisa Adkins, sorry, um, you know, she was talking about, I, I was sort of saying to her, where do you see things going? She was saying v, VR was the next thing that, that would really embrace this gamification and, and this. this um, more physical presence and just recently we've we've um, buddied up to a, a company just a little bit and what we're doing is we're going to run one of our guides forums in a VR setting now the interesting thing about the VR setting that they've created is is that you have a stage and we can present on the stage and they have their tables um, and they actually have they have the ability to shoot emojis at each other and say you know this emoji is your oh. and and interestingly, they also provide a gaming quotient in that where where the tables can play games and et cetera as well. Mm. So I think that's a I, I really think that actually has a next level of starting to bring that together to allow your teams to mesh as well. So sorry to interrupt you there, but it was just something that I, I remembered. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of our partners um, in Poland, uh, the four results community, um, they are running virtual um, experiences. Uh, to teach intent-based leadership. So in other words, you're the crew of a submarine and you have this um, event that you have to, to survive through, right? You have to figure out how do you react to this um, the situation? And you have this simulation of you have this device, you have that device. And it's a really fascinating uh, exercise of imagine you're in this high pressure situation. How do you engage your, uh, your leadership? So um, we're already doing some of that with some of our partners. Yeah, yeah. it's good fun. Yeah, and the submarine is not called Red October, but we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to change tack here a little bit. Um, we'll just swap the, uh, the the wind direction about slightly. Um, you mentioned a little bit earlier you're working with a governance framework for remote uh, for remote working. Um, can you tell us uh, more about what that entails? And I know that you're busy writing a book and that you don't want to let too many cats out of oh, the that's, bag. That's all right. Um, so. You yeah, know, no, I'm really happy to talk to you about that. Like, yeah, yeah. So, yes, there is a book in the works um, one day. Uh, as, as anybody's tried to write a book, that's hard work. Uh, so I'm not going to put a date on that. Uh, the, yeah, so... so Within the remote agility framework, we, we always have the essence of understanding that you needed to, to think about governing your system of work in remote, right? We always, mm -hmm. um, and so for the last nine or so months, we've been working with, there's been a team of us working with Esther Derby, um, who some people will know from the retrospectives book. Um, uh, she's also done many other things other than that as a, a wonderful management consultant. Um, to create what we call the, the patterns of remote governance uh, and talking about governing your system as a whole. So the, the first essence of that is, is framed around what we call the pillars of remote governance. And, and those pillars, myself and a, and a couple of others, over the many, many years that we've been doing this, distilled this down into the, these four pillars that we believe are the pillars that you need to think about when you're governing the system as a whole, right? Let me just premise that not projects, not PMOs, mm. 
Yes, that's part of governance. The work Not just system. Funding. Those things play into it, but there's much more around that, right? And that's why we have the pillars. So we talk about the four pillars in terms of transparency. Mm. The first pillar is transparency. Creation of the information flow horizontally, vertically. We talked about that before, but how you how you have that that transparency that allows you uh, as leaders to understand what's happening in the organisation, what's happening in your systems of work, so that you can make those expedient directional decisions. There's a lot more layers to that, but that's essentially what we're, what we're talking about when we talk about transparency and that 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 linking of the information strategic to to delivery, delivery to, to strategic, and then. If you're going to have that transparency, then you have to think about leadership. And of course, we, we've touched on that just before. But leadership is a, is a major pillar because you have to change the frame of the way you, you, you're mm -hmm. leading and thinking about leading with intent, leading with an, an understanding how that transparency enables your ability to make your directional decisions and how you need to move more in a more expedient frame now that you're in a remote and hybrid work. And that's just something that, that, that I don't think organisations are quite coming to grip with, grips with. My reasoning around that is a couple of things. Obviously, we all know, you know, it's a VUCA world out there and we've got all that volatility and uncertainty, et cetera. But the other thing is you've got a, you've got a, a workforce of people, not resources, people who are at home, who are waiting sometimes because they don't know what to do. Now, you can't afford to have that. And that's exacer exacerbated by this whole remote frame. So you have to be able to make those directional decisions. Otherwise, you've got people who are being zoomed out of their brain or they're bored out of it, or they're just doing other work or you don't know they're working on the right thing. So changing that leadership style to click into the and use transparency. To enable that, to enable that, you need that system of work and you need to design that system of work so that it, it enables the ability to create the transparency. Mm. It enables the leadership to understand what's happening in the end, and it also allows your people to work in the best way to get the organisational um, structure working well. Underpinning all of that is the last pillar, which is information. And we, we, we bring that out in its own sense because information is, is the thing that allows you to have transparency. It's the thing that allows you to, to lead in a better way. So you want to be able to make fact-based decisions. To make fact-based decisions, you have to have data and you have to measure the right things. We all know that, mm -hmm. right? And it's essentially it underpins your system of work because information allows your people and allows the system of work to operate well. Now, in remote, you have to change your thought around the information that you're consuming. <clears throat> because the, the, the things that once we used in physicality rather than in the digital environment aren't going to work. And I'll give you an example of that. You know, we worked with an organisation where all of their reporting was in a spreadsheet to start with. <laughs> Secondarily, when you went through it and you looked at it, they, they moved into a remote frame. You know, 60 to 70% of what they were actually reporting, no one was using. Mm. The other thing around that is you now have a, you know, this whole plethora of digital uh, mechanisms that you can consume the information as well. And then we talk in, in terms of things like um, thinking about a virtual obeyer. Uh, so one of the things that we, we, we have in, within that suite of governance is thinking about the virtual obeyer. And the, if anybody remembers obeyer rooms or, or war rooms or whatever you want to call them, the big rooms with the cards on them and you used to be able to go in there and see how you program. You can't do that in physical. And in fact, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I saw people trying to do that online. <laughs> it wasn't pretty. You know, they were over here shifting the cards and the rest of the team had gone to sleep. So you want to, do, mm -hmm. you want to construct that in a virtual way that allows you to pull in the pillars of information and, so that you can you can actually absorb that in the best way that you can. And then what we've done is we've taken that and working with S the Derby C model that I talked about before, we have brought those two together so that we have that extra layer within each of those pillars of thinking about how does that affect the steering layer? How does that affect the, affect the enabling, enhancing, and how does that affect the making? Um, and then using um, the, the last of those things is overlaying over that what we call the clarity, the concerns and the constraints, the three C's. Always lots of C's around now, but we call that the, yeah, the system enablers, right? But it's also yeah. thinking in the frame of each of those layers and each of those pillars, what are those things that we need to have the clarity? What are those concerns and what are those, those constraints? And we talked about constraints before. And then what we've done is constructed a number of patterns and a number of exercises 
to allow you to work through each of those pillars, either in modularity, because sometimes that's all you need to do, depending on the organisation, or you may only have the keys to the castle and work in that piece till you get to the next piece. Um, we prefer that you work you know, systematic with the whole thing because the reason we have the pillars, and I talk to people about the pillars, is if, if one's out of out of kilter, it's a bit like a uh, seesaw, right? The rest yeah. of where you need them to be, and that's why actually if you see the diagram at any stage, we've got two on either side and a circle in the middle, and that's the inference is you've got to have them all in balance for the organisation to be working well. But we've constructed that in, in a modular way so that you can work through that in modularity. You can work through that incrementally. And these exercises and patterns that we've created allow you to actually start to make that change, to think about how you make that change and mm. be used at any level. So, you know, if you have the, the ability to work with the, the, the executive leadership, you'll be able to do this, which is part of preferred to, to get them involved. But if you only have the middle layer or, or, or middle leadership, then you can do this and propel that upwards and propel that downwards, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. One thing that um, comes to mind for me is uh, Niccolo Machiavelli. Um, interesting Italian um, political commentator, shall we say, <laughs> <laughs> from, a, from a few uh, hundred years ago. And um, he proposes a fairly, shall we say, stark view of um, authority and power. Um, one way or another, I noticed that we haven't really advanced um, spiritually much uh, in the last few thousand years. So we still have to deal with intense ego battles and strife and struggle and maneuverings and political backstabbings and, and so on. And um, on the one hand, you could argue that in this day and age of social media, um, it's potentially harder to get away with things, but it's also quite easier to engage in deliberate uh, disinformation and um, gaming and um, character assassination and voice suppression of um, opponents and, and so on. So I'm really interested in uh, how do we cultivate dialogue in a manner that addresses polarization? How do we depolarize our conversations such that we get better outcomes for our organizations because ultimately the people that suffer the most from infighting within organizations are the customers or the clients yeah so what are your thoughts in terms of how do we approach the work of oversight to actually hold to account and deal effectively with shenanigans it's an interesting one is it? and you know there's a there's a there's always been that piece in me that thinks that always likes to think that everybody is a good person uh, in total, but perhaps the extrinsic intrinsic factors of the organizational constructs that they found themselves within has created these patterns of, of behavior. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's about helping them and helping the organizations hold the mirror up to themselves. Um, and, you know, when we were constructing some time ago, because those pillars sort of came about, you know, maybe three, four years ago before we actually moved into this total remote type of thing. One of those things that, are, that, that is transparency is that mirror. Um, transparency takes many fashions. And when you hold the mirror of transparency up, that shows the, the effect of what you're doing on your people, on your organisation, that often has a stark reality. Now, I'm not saying that, that 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 works in every shape or form, but that's the first thing that I tackle is, you know, you heard me say fact-based decisions and data, et cetera. I don't like data-driven decisions, mm. <laughs> but you're just using the data to drive a decision. What I want them to think about is here are the facts. They're fact-based because this is, this is reality. What are the decisions are you going to make around that fact base to resolve what you're seeing? And this cannot be about you as an individual and your behavior. 
you have to change your behavior to enable this. And for me, that, that is a big change. That's why I, you know, I, I gravitate to the intent-based leadership because that's really changing the frame of reference in the way mm. that you're working and you're talking with people. And it does hold the mirror up. Um, do I think that this is something that we're going to solve overnight? No, but I do feel that there is a tidal wave of change. I'm seeing more organisations at least having the conversation about how do we change the frame of leadership? How do we change the, the, the way that we actually work with our people? Now, is that always with the most serious intent? Well, that's the, what do you really, really want? <laughs> Tell me what you really want. Because if it's not, then you're just going to do more damage than you started with. And I think that's, that's the, the intent for us is to, to help them understand, A, if you, you're serious about this, we can help you get where you need to go. But B, if you're not serious about this, then you're just going to create more damage than you've ever created before. And so I think that that's that. The second piece that you heard me mention, extrinsic, intrinsic factors, that for me goes to that whole governing the system of work, but it's enabling them to understand the effects externally and internally that are creating those behaviour patterns and that they're reacting to and how can we, how can we deal with that in a better way? So you mean you mean I have to work? I have to do the work to change. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the reality of life is, is that if you, if you're not working as a leader, whether that be working on being a leader or working at and enabling your leaders, then you're probably not fulfilling the role that you were meant to do in the first place. And I, I have said that to leaders before, obviously at the the. Um, Detriment, I could. <laughs> so, far, so far, no one's taken me out of the building. <laughs> but, but I think it's a it, it's a very strong statement to, to being is what 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 is what is your leader your job as a leader? And that's a question that often takes some answering. Even yeah, I think that they would answer that because often it becomes a process question. I, my answer is no. I don't want to hear the process. What is it that you, as a leader? Are supposed to be doing for this organization yeah yeah a really interesting challenge here is um detecting and addressing malevolence um, most of us want to feel that when you come to work uh, it should be a safe environment it should be um welcoming it should be um nourishing it should be a joyful experience to be at work most of us want to embrace you know theory x theory, theory y um, want to embrace the notion of people are generally good and they don't need a whip yeah, or, or um, an explicit carrot. Mm. And yet um, different people are in different positions in their individual contexts, in their lives. Some people are struggling with, with hurt, with uh, personal or family drama. There may be health issues, there may be uh, familial disputes and and so on so therefore some people may not be in uh, a genuine collegial mood shall we say and um, unfortunately humanity also has amongst its ranks some population of people with psychopathic uh, tendencies people that genuinely are wired in such a way that they do not um, experience empathy the way that most of us do mm. Right. And as a result, uh, some of them tend to um, engage in behaviors that achieve results, but damage quite a lot of people in the process. And by achieving results, our economic context tends to reward that. So therefore, in our leadership echelons, we tend to have a bit more of the people with psychopathic tendencies that otherwise might be the case, which is why my personal mission or curiosity, if you will, is how do we help people to redeem themselves? How do we help people to consider, despite their temptations, how to look at the world of work a little bit differently to cultivate a little bit more connection and empathy and how to let go of everything has to be in my personal benefit, but rather more, 
how can we benefit together? How can we get more of a more of a win win? What are your thoughts in that space? It, it, I like that you brought that up because you know we talked a little bit today about leadership and intent based leadership and etc. There's another frame of reference that I uh, I like, and it's a, a, a wonderful gentleman who I class as a friend of mine, Christopher Avery, um, and I highly recommend it. But if you haven't read his book, The Responsibility Process. I really, the frame of reference that he uses, that he uses within that, the responsibility process is fantastic. Um, but the, the premise of what are you, you know, what are you responsible for? What are you accountable for? There's two different things there. And responsibility versus accountability changes the frame of the way they work. And it's thinking about why they do things that they do that, right? So for example, there's a ladder and I won't go through them all, but think you know there's this this you know that accountability there's shame there's etc right and thinking about they're different from responsibility so the minute you can delineate those then you start to understand well, okay what am I really responsible what am I accountable for that plays into intent-based leadership as far as I'm concerned I can see the the similes with the two because it allows you then to go okay what are the guide rails that I can help people set as well right and this is not just organization this is personally so the, I really like the, the, the mesh, those, those, those thoughts. Um, you know, there's lots of other work being done out there by the, the likes of Amy Edmondson, et cetera, which talk about psychological safety. And I think, you know, we have to play into those. We have to, we have to think about those and mesh them into the conversation as well. Um, it's, it's, it's an interesting task at hand. Uh, and I think the interesting thing for me is I do see I do see that there is light because there are a lot more, there are a lot more organizations open to the conversation than there were before. And if you had mentioned these things three, four years ago, you probably wouldn't have got your foot in the door. But now with remote and hybrid coming over and creating this, this, this uh, contention, there's a lot more organizations willing to have that conversation about it. The second thing of that is I think there's a lot more people who are looking at that higher order and going, you know, look, I've been doing Agile a long time and this is not about the Agile conversation, but I think Agile also had, you know, it grew up through organisations and you hear this thing about servant leadership and Agile leadership. And I actually think that, that that's something that the community in itself has made a mistake in because we have people who are not qualified, who are Agile coaches who are trying to teach people how to lead. Um, they're trying to te teach people uh, how to work in these, these, these frames of reference when you, you have these organisational issues. And I really think that that's a, a situation where you either go and do some work on yourself um, and, and understand what you need to do, or you find the right people to enable that conversation. Uh, even in that frame, like, you know, um, if you do your life coaching, there's a point in life coaching where it's, you're not qualified for that. You need to get us, you know, that, 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 that falls into psychology or, you know, psych that you need to go and get the right person to help this person. It's about identifying that. And I know I sort of took a bit of a turn in there, but I think it's into interplayed into that conversation as well. Welcome to my soapbox, Tony. You've just... <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a big bugbear of mine. Uh, many people think in, in the industry that you can do a three-day agile coaching uh, course, get a certificate, and now you can command uh, high um, prices in the market. And then you don't even know how to uh, use uh, tools such as the Grow model, for instance, um, in the right way. Uh, I have a big problem with that. Um, and I've been having that same problem for the last five to eight years in people calling themselves agile coaches. So, yeah. Well, I think if you call yourself an agile coach, you're a coach agile, right? Uh, that's that's the, the the differential there. If you're if you're going to take on anything more than that, then change your frame of reference. And I, you know, there's some people out there doing some wonderful work, like Michael yeah. Spade and, and Lisa Adkins have done some fantastic work around, you know, the leadership circles and mm -hmm. and you've got Orsk and you've got Grow and, and and those things. So the avenues are there, but don't just jump headlong into something that you shouldn't jump into because you can do 
Yeah, and I think that's the thing that people don't understand, and I've seen it because I've had to come in and work with it, is that you can do, you can actually do not only organisational, but personal damage. Yeah. Uh, and and that's something that you need to be really aware. It, it's not a failing to say, look, that's not in my wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. You know, th- these are things that, that I, I can see that you need some help in this, but it's not something that I should be, and, you know, here are some people that can help you or here's the right, you know, that, there's no shame in that. The, the inference that you have to be the answer to everything is not right. That brings to mind the drama triangle. Because in the drama triangle, we have this um, temptation of, oh, I'm the victim. I need rescuing. I need to be helped. Oh, poor me. Yeah. And there is the rescuer. Hey, I'm here to rescue you, you poor victim. And then there's the oppressor. You will do what I tell you, you victim, you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. So the challenge there is, how do you deal with the drama triangle? Well, the short answer is figure out a way not to have to play. Because mm. you don't want to be an oppressor. You don't really want to be a victim. And you don't really want to be a rescuer. Because mm. everybody is trapped yeah. in um, a dynamic that's not really generative. Things are actually worsening. That is by design, not a virtuous, but a vicious cycle. Yeah. So essentially the key of assisting one another is not how can I help you, but how can we get together stronger? Because ultimately you need to develop your own ability and where you don't have skill yourself, you get some supporting skill and you build a team capability with skill from somebody else in the team. But it's not about I'm helping you, it's we're helping each other. Mm. And that all of a sudden changes the balance, changes the dynamic from, oh, you're the victim that needs help. You're weak. You can't do this alone. Well, guess what? Everybody's weak on their own. Nobody has all the strengths. Nobody has all the insights. We need teamwork as our cognitive capacity is such that we can't comprehend massive things. But when we pool our capabilities together and I help a little bit with this and you help a little bit with that. We get stronger together. And that's what's often forgotten in pursuit of, oh, I shall be this well-regarded, you know, it's a status play and hey, uh, what are you going to do? Because society rewards that. Um, When's the last time you saw or, or heard some women talking amongst themselves and saying to themselves, oh yeah, I'm so looking forward to um, having a tumble in the hay with that really useless guy. Yeah, it never happens. You have to sort of be effective, be capable, be well regarded, so that you then have some form of social capital, so that you can actually form a life that you can enjoy. So that's that's tough. It's challenging. All of us come into life not well supplied with competence and capability all of us have to learn so all of us will have at some point in our lives suffered from this um imposter syndrome uh, feeling right it's like uh, i don't really know how to do this but i'm gonna attempt to to look like i'm uh, even halfway decent or competent so we have very much a, a social challenge in our hands as to how to help ourselves to learn, how to help ourselves to collaborate, how to help ourselves to challenge each other. These are kind of the basic ingredients in in building psychological safety well. But it's not just about safety. It's also about courage. Mm -hmm. So I'll leave you with this um, question in, in closing. What are your thoughts on cultivating courage in organizations? That's a good one that always comes up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to answer that, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer something else that I just I just wanted to do before I forget it. Because uh, uh, I could see that the, the people will think that I'm just ragging on the Agile community here, and I'm not, because um, the stuff that I just described, I see leadership consultants do the same thing, supposed leadership consultants, you know, strategy consultants, et cetera. It's just probably with the Agile community, it's become more prominent because of the Agile transformation things, right? But it it still replies on that. Um, The second thing I just wanted to say, 
when I've had conversations like I'm just having with you, somebody's ragged on me and, and said, well, you, you, you've got the remote agile framework. You're just an agile framework. Can I make the point? The word in there is agility, remote agility framework. We're not an agile framework. We use mm. the word agility purposefully because that's about being able to move to shape, to be moved nimbly, to allow you to work in a remote way. So I'm getting in ahead of anybody else that thinks of that. <laughs> <laughs> right, because I've been there before. All right. So, secondly, courage in the workplace is a hard one, isn't it? Um, because you 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 can be consistently not rewarded for courage, and in fact, you can be a troublemaker. You can you can not be remunerated <laughs> properly because you you've been co courageous. But the, I think there's a fine line between courage and silliness, <laughs> right? Yeah, you can get yourself into trouble. In, in, a, in, in a lot of different ways. Um, I had a great mentor who used to say, do what you need to do when, you, when it comes to courage, do what you need to do to get things done. Don't get arrested and don't get fired. And it puts an interesting frame around courage. Um, thank you, Mr. Coburn. Uh, easy for him to say. But it's essentially the sentiment is right within that is, is that when we're teaching people to, to be courageous in what they do, it's about how they call that out, how they take that frame of reference and how they work with it. Now that changes whether you're, you're, you know, you're a leader or you're not a leader or whatever role that you're fulfilling is understanding within that environment, how you can best bring that transparency of, of these issues to light and using those mechanisms because you know you, you don't want to be that one that, that that ends up in the in the frying pan for the sake of everybody else because often you're bringing all the issues for everybody else up and then they walk away from the frying pan and you're the only one sitting in the frying pan right mm -hmm. but it, it, it there's this, there's there's no standard answer to that i don't think i think there's there's things um i like group thought not group think and i talk to teams about that a lot You've got group thought. You've got a very powerful voice here as a group thought. How you purvey that thought now to the leaders is very important. It has to come across as group thought. This is this is the, the thoughts that we have. Group think is where it's more mob rule, right? Mm. And it works the same in leadership is I talk to leaders a lot about group thought, not group think. Mm. And working together. So being courageous in working as leaders is often very hard because as a singular leader, if you're going to be the maverick that can create some real tension points. And often when I'm working with, with uh, leaders, I, I, I actually use the heart of agile for those that haven't come across that, you know, collaborate, deliver, reflect, improve. And I run an exercise with that and I ask the leaders to, particularly in the collaborate, we'll worry about those other ones later, but the, the collaborate piece is the piece that plays in this answer, is, is I ask them to, to, to put into their how are they going to collaborate better with their organisation? How are they going to collaborate with people? And then the big question is, when was the last time you collaborated together as a leadership team? Because that, that for me is courageous, right? And often, do you know the answer I often get in there? And I've done this a lot of times, like I do a lot of senior leader training. Um, was, and out of, I was looking at the data from 35 workshops and the answer that came back was, oh, we meet or we have a scheduled meet. Or we have a scheduled forum. And so my, my question to that is, yes, but what does that do? And they go, oh, we do this, this. Okay, so when did you last collaborate about actually being leaders? And that's the differential here is because it's easier to be courageous as leaders, as a group, and working together with group thought about how you can then work for the betterment of the organisation or talk to the CEO or to the CEO, whatever that might be, or working with your people as, as, as a group team if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you so much, Tony. I really enjoyed the conversation. It's Sorry. been a I really enjoyed it myself. Thank you for your time and uh, it was a great chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. See you next I'll time. I'll do. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.